The year 2000, according to Arthur C. Clarke and his now famous 2001 Space Odyssey, was supposed to have been the year of great discovery. Did technology keep pace with the dream? By now, we were supposed to have a fully functioning space station and routine flights into the cosmos. But so far, we've only made it to the shuttle stage. Why? Recently, life, in the form of tiny bacteria, was discovered on a piece of rock believed to have come from Mars. Does this mean life exists on other planetary bodies in our solar system? And are we willing to go there and find out? Or will we settle for photographs? A billion dollars was poured into a satellite called the Mars Observer. Will it give us the answers? 80,000 new images have recently been released. Have actual artifacts been discovered among them? Actually, a funny thing happened on the way to Mars. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. It's been over 30 years since the United States accomplished the astounding feat of landing a man on the moon. But for some as yet unknown reason, American manned space exploration has been all but junked. Instead of returning to the moon and building bases or going on to Mars to find out what's there, we're confined to low Earth orbit, operating essentially a trucking company called the Shuttle, while an entire solar system beckons. How could the futurists have been so wrong? In the same 30 years, technology has taken us from this to this. Communication technology has done away with the tether, while computers have opened up undreamed of possibilities, putting computer power at virtually everyone's fingertips. But today's space program uses essentially the same technology developed for the Viking program 30 years ago. NASA's Sidonia discovery in 76, and it's now obvious 20 years suppression, had a profound if negative influence on the direction, if not the pace, of the entire space program. To those behind the program, the presence of a human face on the surface of a nearby planet immediately seemed to imply the chilling scene of alien intervention. Could that be the answer? Was the development of space technology deliberately impeded for fear of the discovery of alien artifacts? Or had someone already decided the artifact had been found and they were simply implementing policy? Clear back in 1959, NASA had commissioned a study by the prestigious Brookings Institute entitled innocuously, Proposed Studies on the Implications of Peaceful Space Activities for Human Affairs. Given all the activities surrounding the sudden appearance of dozens of UFO sightings over the preceding 10 years, it is perhaps not too surprising that this study included a section entitled Implications of a Discovery of Extraterrestrial Life. In this section of the 264-page document, Brookings experts advise NASA that, quote, cosmologists and astronomers think it quite likely that there is intelligent life in many solar systems, and astonishingly concluded that, quote, artifacts left at some point in time by these life forms might possibly be discovered through our own space activities on the Moon, Mars, or Venus. They went on to point out, long before Arthur C. Clarke put words in the mouth of his futuristic space administrator, the grave potential for social dislocation and cultural shock should this be prematurely disclosed. In fact, they recommended strongly total suppression of this information. But the question still remained. Was this indeed an artifact or just an interesting anomaly? Hoagland and his team attacked the work with vigor. The photographs had shown more than just the face. There were other structures nearby that seemed to suggest an artificial construction. Could there be an answer to the complex geometry the Mars mission had begun to develop around these nearby structures? Maybe there's a connection. Maybe the face of Sidonia is half man, half something else. First, they copied the left half of the Cydonia head, made a mirror image of it, and pasted it onto the other side. The results were interesting, but inconclusive. However, when they tried the same thing with the right half, flipped it over and matched it up on the left side, the result was a clear image of a lion. Are these merely strange optical illusions, or are they the key to understanding the real truth about a connection between Earth and Mars? 
Surely it's possible that mere coincidence could account for this seemingly mysterious connection. But what was needed was some sort of scientific proof. Here in southwest England, the man-made mountain of Silbury Hill has loomed over the horizon since time immemorial. Nearby is Avebury, another megalithic monument believed to be thousands of years old, with an eroding earthen wall preserving an inner circle of partially preserved ancient standing stones. The area also contains an amazing connection to the structures at Sidonia. The connection here was determined not by simple observation or even supposition, but was founded on the plain facts of geometry. The question was, what if these ancient monuments in England corresponded in size, shape, and dimension to a set of geometric features on a plain called Sidonia? What if Avebury Circle in England was in fact intended to represent, to be an analog of the crater at Sidonia? And Silbury Hill, a few miles to the south, came to represent the Tholus at Sidonia on Mars. The angles and positions of these ancient features, including where the cliff would be, where the tetrahedral pyramid seems to lie, and this specific angle interconnecting them both, the infamous 19.5, all seem to match, including the very size of Silbury Hill in terms of its exterior moat with reference to the Tholus. It was at this point that we began to worry less about the ultimate reality of the face on Mars and more about the meaning and the message of Sidonia. But could there be more to this message than even Hoagland and his team imagine? More than just a scientific message? Could it be that the pyramids of Egypt and the pyramids of Sidonia share a common biblical tribute to the creator of the universe? We use typology, which is the study of symbols and their meaning in biblical scripture, to understand what's on the surface of Mars and Sidonia. We found that the entire Sidonia complex relates to the prophecies in the Old and the New Testament of the first and the second coming of Christ. The Sidonia architecture is a geometric representation of scripture. The face represents Jesus, and the giant hill, or the Tholus, is an altar to God. The Tholus was built to the exact specifications that God gave to Moses in the book of Exodus. The Sidonia builders obviously knew that God in the future would dwell with men in human form on the earth. And who were the inhabitants of Mars? Our studies have shown that it was a civilization of pre-rebellion angels who lived on Mars before the creation of human beings on the earth. This civilization used their monuments to give glory to God, their creator. The builders of the monuments who once followed God, their creator, were destroyed for the rebellion against him. We also see in the destruction of the monuments of Mars by a great cataclysm, a precursor of what may happen on the earth in the future. Whether or not these biblical references are meaningful, of course, or whether Hoagland's geometry is valid, depends entirely on being able to prove the Martian monuments are true artifacts. And NASA seems curiously indifferent to trying to find that proof, even though they apparently had the means. On September 25, 1992, the most sophisticated space probe of its kind was launched into outer space. The Mars Observer was designed to orbit, photograph, and carefully study the red planet in greater detail than ever before. Was the extensive work done by Hoagland and his Mars mission team sufficiently intriguing to convince NASA to re-photograph the face? Not by a long shot. The space agency, in fact, did something completely unprecedented. Since the first television cameras were sent on space missions in the mid-1960s, NASA has always shared its video images with the world. But just before the launch of the Mars Observer, NASA announced that for the first time, it would not allow any images to be broadcast on television. Why? Why would the National Space Agency suddenly change a policy that had stood for nearly 40 years? Could it be that there was more at work here than the fabled galactic ghoul? Has NASA violated one of its oldest and most rigid protocols? By the time Mars Observer reached orbit, 
The heated, sometimes bitter controversy over the face on Mars had been ongoing for ten long years. If these discoveries truly were proof that there once was intelligent life on another world, it seemed only reasonable to try and get a closer look at Cydonia. Mars Observer would have done exactly that, but instead, the launch turned into a bizarre puzzle. On July 22nd, it was announced that the Mars Observer had disappeared 14 hours earlier. According to the official announcement, contact had been lost at 6 p.m. Pacific time the previous evening. For some inexplicable reason, NASA had postponed the announcement for 14 hours. The timing of the announcement was odd enough, but things just got stranger and stranger. For the first time in NASA's history, its technicians had deliberately instructed the spacecraft to turn the telemetry off. So when the accident occurred, there was literally no downlink back to ground control so the engineers could ever reconstruct what exactly occurred. There are those who believe that whoever or whatever it is that doesn't want us to get a closer look at the red planet is not in outer space but here on Earth. The Mars Observer mission may have been doomed before it even left the ground. Hurricane Andrew hit the coast of Florida just about the time the uh, Mars Observer was being prepared for launch. Even though it had been prepared for such an onslaught, technicians checked the probe to make sure that it had not been damaged by the storm. The nitrogen system was equipped with special filters to prevent such uh, uh, dust and debris from being taken into the system and the cameras were in a separate compartment. In spite of this, bits of paper and dust and debris was found in both compartments. It looked as though someone had swept the floor and dumped the results into the compartments. It's unlikely that Hurricane Andrew would have been responsible for all of this. But why would anyone want to sabotage a photographic mission to Mars? What is there about our neighboring planet that someone doesn't want us to see? Hoagland's team has developed several scenarios to answer that question. One is that we had a previous high-tech civilization here on Earth, which went to Mars, built some stuff, and then collapsed. And only now are we rediscovering our heritage. A second hypothesis is that someone else, someone from far away, hundreds or even thousands of light years from the solar system, came to this system, came to Mars, built a civilization and left an artifact in the form of a proto-human being so that we would know thousands of years down the line that they in fact had touched us here on Earth. Someday we may discover that in fact we are the Martians. Assuming for the moment that there could have been a flourishing race on Mars at some time in the distant past, why would they bother to build such huge monuments? Sidonia was probably constructed to communicate something very fundamental. In fact, from the geometry we found, we believe it was designed to communicate a whole new physics, a grand unified field theory, as it were, given to us, communicated even by the Viking photographs, by the geometric layout of the structures. Researchers now believe that the key to understanding the geometry of the DNM pyramid may be in the size, shape, and position of the massive structure. Hoagland and others point out that the pyramid is not oriented to the Martian North Pole, but is turned slightly to one side. Latitude lines show that two of the faces are out of alignment at exactly the same angle, 19.5 degrees. Why 19.5? On every major or minor planet that NASA has flown by, photographed, or mapped in the last 30 years, there appears to be a major disturbance located just about 19.5 degrees north or south. The great red spot on the planet Jupiter is essentially a giant cyclone, an atmospheric storm larger than the entire planet Earth that continues to churn year after year at 19.5 degrees south. According to Hoagland, on every planet in our solar system, there does seem to be some kind of major geological or atmospheric disturbance at 19.5 degrees north or south, including our own gigantic volcano, Mauna Loa, raging up from the center of the Earth and the Hawaiian Islands at 19.5 degrees north. 
Does this suggest that the builders of the DNM period recorded in its structure a key to the inner nature of every planet in our system, including our own? Could it be there is a reason for leaving the number 19.5 encrypted in a pyramid? This is a four-sided, four-cornered figure known for thousands of years as a tetrahedron. If you put this structure inside a sphere, such as a planet, it predicts by a hundred-year-old mathematical theory some remarkable physical properties. Hoagland claims that if you place a perfect tetrahedron or pyramid within a sphere, such as a planet, so that one tip is at the north or south pole, the other tips will fall at the latitude of 19.5 degrees, the same as the angles discovered in the D&M pyramid. 19.5 is a significant number in the Bible. It symbolizes faith. In biblical numerics, 19 is associated with the most faithful people and the greatest promises in the Bible. The point five of this number represents grace and hope. And that is precisely what Hoagland and his associates have continued to do. Hope. So far as anyone knows, the Mars Observer was never heard from again. Then two more failures stunned NASA as a Mars orbiter and the Mars polar lander both failed in 1999. But there was a probe that did make it into orbit, the Mars Global Surveyor. We thought our hopes would finally bear fruit in 1998 with a NASA JPL agreement to finally reimage the face using this incredibly sophisticated camera flying on the Mars Global Surveyor spacecraft. Things truly seemed to be coming together. In 1996, NASA had announced the possible discovery of ancient life in a piece of rock that had come all the way from Mars. Finally, on the 5th of April, 1998, after almost a quarter of a century of waiting, we got from Mars Global Surveyor what should have been an exquisite, much higher resolution image of the face on Mars. Unfortunately, after JPL got through enhancing what came to be known in some circles as the cat box image, there was nothing left to see, which was obviously their intent all along. As you might suspect, NASA and JPL were not the only imaging experts to view the 1998 photographs. The image that JPL released to the media in 1998 uh, is not at all a faithful representation of even the raw data, let alone what is actually there. Image processing experts who have now uh, treated the image properly have shown that it does indeed look very much like a hominid face. Uh, when we got the original image of the face in 1976, uh, there was always the possibility that it was just a trick of light and shadow or something um, that was an accident of nature. When we got the high resolution image, to our amazement, all of the secondary facial features were there too. Uh, eyebrow, irises, nostrils and lips with the correct size, shape, location and orientation to be portrayals of a humanoid face. The odds against each of those things happening by accident range from 1 in 10 to 1 in 10,000. When you put them all together, the odds against all of them being accidents of nature are 100 billion billion to 1. Based on the results of the test, the object is artificial beyond a reasonable doubt. The Mars Global Surveyor went into orbit in late 1997 and since has been sending back literally tens of thousands of exquisite pictures of all of Mars. But Malin Scientific and Dr. Malin himself, who have the chief contract with the camera, have actually only been releasing these pictures in dribs and drabs, spaced out over several months and even years. Until Arizona Senator John McCain let NASA know in no uncertain terms that there would be a day of reckoning if in fact it were proven that the agency had deliberately withheld vital information either from the Congress or from the American taxpayer. Suddenly, without warning, JPL released nine new Sidonia images some as much as two years old. Eventually, 60,000 new images of Mars were dramatically released, and on those, some breathtaking discoveries have now begun to quietly unfold. For instance, perched on a mile-high cliff in the Martian equivalent of the Grand Canyon, Valles Marineris, there is something which gives the impression of being the equivalent of a Martian flying saucer. 
As you can see, this is a distinct oval. In fact, it's a convex oval with the sun coming from this direction, the shadow side here, a fluted rim hanging several hundred feet over this very steep vertical cliff a mile above the valley floor. If you look at the image on the right, you can actually see that in addition to it being oval, it has a pointed front. And on the front, there are windows. In the back, with very interesting symmetry configuration, there appear to be the engines. In June of 2000, we discovered potentially our most extraordinary artifact. This mile-long, several hundred foot wide structure with translucent exterior, a brilliant sun glint, and evenly spaced ribs that looks for all the world like an artificially constructed glass tunnel, which some have termed, like Arthur Clarke, a glass worm on the surface of a planet where it has, again, no business being. We have over a mile-long, curvilinear, convex structure with these extraordinary ribs that appear to be some kind of structural support, and right in the middle there's a brilliant sun glint and a darker shadow, indicating in the model that this is a constructed object that maybe it's a transportation tube. And this little thing, which actually is several hundred feet wide on the scale of the photograph, is perhaps a car trapped in the middle of the tube when whatever disaster hit Mars and broke the tube at this point hit the planet. It's sometimes hard to gauge what's going on on Mars from a two-dimensional photograph. So what we did was go to one of our Enterprise mission colleagues, Chris Joseph, and ask him to submit this image to a shape from shading algorithm. What that allows us to do is to recreate a three-dimensional construction of the two-dimensional form. And what we clearly see is an undulating glass-like tunnel with a sharp break at the position of the car, continuing on down the valley, as one would expect of a greatly eroded ancient artificial structure on the planet Mars. The great mystery at this point seems to be if the Enterprise mission and its colleagues can find all this and so much more, then why can't NASA? Or is there something more? Is it possible that they have seen what we have seen and also understand what's really there, but have a reason to keep silent? Is this face just a natural formation? Or was it constructed by some long-lost civilization? And what of the pyramids on Mars? Are they the ancestors of the pyramids of Egypt or just neatly shaped piles of Martian soil? Can it be that the perfect geometric precision found in these surface features is just a series of bizarre coincidences? And are we up to the task of finding out? For 33 years, ever since the epic journeys of Apollo, we have essentially been marking time. 30 years marks the span of time between Charles Lindbergh epic transatlantic journey and the first orbit of the Earth by Sputnik. Following that curve, by now, we should have inherited the solar system. Is it possible that the controversy of the past two decades was contrived just to prepare us for the impact of the knowledge that there may indeed be life somewhere beyond Earth? If the remarkable achievements of the Mars Global Surveyor bring about a renewed interest in the marvels of the cosmos in which we live, future generations may, after all, look back on 2001 as we looked forward to it as the year of discovery.